Uh, thanks, Jacinta. Listen, um, I feel a bit of a fraud in front of you today because I haven't been a clinician or run a research group for eight years, and it's probably been 16 years since I was a full-time clinician scientist. So I was a bit nervous what to say. So I was cycling during the week um, uh, with an early career researcher in, in this field. And I said, what the hell am I going to say? And she said, whatever you do, don't tell them the truth. <laughs> so then I thought, well, that's not much help. So I went to my kids. They've both got PhDs. And um, I said, what do I say? And they say, oh, it's very easy for advice. Tell them to start 40 years ago. It was a lot easier. I don't think that's true either. So I'll just get the gear going here. Now, um, summarize that really well. Um, so you just see here on, um, I forgot RPAH first before going to the university. So I was born in this hospital. <laughs> and not only that, looking for pedigree, I was delivered by the professor of obstetrics. <laughs> and not only that, there have only been two Australian obstetricians who've ever held the um, Sims Black Travelling Fellowship. And one of them delivered the other. So there's a nice little story. Um, university here, um, I was at medical school with Liz. Um, she looks 15 years younger, but uh, that's my problem. Um, the, um, but those were different days. I mean, university was free. We got a study allowance, whatever it was. Um, Liz, I think it's fair to say I was never in danger of getting honours. I think that would be true. <laughs> um, didn't do a BSc or any of those things. And... Why did I do OBGYN? Well, it was medicine and surgery because I couldn't decide. And I was just fascinated by the biology of reproduction. So did my training mainly here, a year in South Africa, which is very interesting. Towards, so you grew up in this environment here, which was the aim in life was to drive a Porsche and to do private practice. That's why you did a specialty. And just got a little bit bored with that towards the end and had a couple of mentors who were academic, who just made such a difference. So I managed to parachute myself into a lecture job in Aberdeen, um, then did subspecialty fellowship with a PhD in, in London. Um, now, in those days, my interest, my subspecialty is fetal medicine, and the fetus inside the mother's womb was just a black box. We were only just beginning to see inside it. We could all of a sudden develop techniques to take blood from it and begin to operate and do all sorts of things, measure blood flow. So it led to characterization of all the systems that exists and then attempts, albeit fairly crude, at, at sort of intrauterine treatment and therapies. But that was a, a fun time. I came back here for a year as a staff specialist and I just, through sheer luck, managed to land a tenured chair at um, what was the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, Imperial College London. Spent 16 years there, but normally get bored after that time. You get bored after about eight years. But they moved the whole hospital into a bigger enterprise. We merged with Imperial College, new research institute, et cetera. So that staved off boredom for another eight years till I felt like sitting there talking to patients about the same disease all the time. I needed something different. So I went to Queensland where I had a patch of lawn and they built, built me a 10,000 square meter research institute that I had the pleasure of filling and getting going for the first couple of years. That was fun. Then moved more into... Um, academic leadership, I guess, as, as Dean's roles. Dean's is one of those jobs it's nice to have done, not to do, but um, I'm glad I did it. Um, interesting, in a 30-something year career as a professor, I have never given an undergraduate lecture, and I'm really proud of that. Um, it's, that just shows the research focus that's, oh, no, 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 that, that's gone on. So my current job, um, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Enterprise, so um, I look after, I guess, you know, total research income with all the on costs is 1.3 billion or something, 4,000 PhD students, 16 major infrastructure centers, the country's top university for entrepreneurship, new patents and patent families, and spin outs. It's a lot of fun, but I spend most of my time quantum computing, materials, renewable energy, CubeSats, space, that sort of stuff. So, enough of an introduction. Now, we're talking about this animal, clinical scientist. Now, sorry I missed this morning as to what you've heard, but you know, there are some problems. You get pulled in both directions. Some of them come right up against each other. Very simple, as long as you work a 35-hour week for the hospital and a 35-hour week for the university or your medical research institute. But life's not like that. All those challenges I'm sure you've heard about, two employers, two sets of rules, firewalls, terms and conditions, IT systems, and sometimes it feels a problem. But there is a huge upside. And, and my own perspective, I know you've had others, is 
you really do get to operate at the cutting edge of a discipline. You're right in the top echelon of clinicians. You get to lead, not follow. You can cure the patient for a while, but you begin to work on curing the disease or the problem. You get to travel, conferences, networks, all that sort of stuff. I mean, I'm still doing two or 300,000 kilometres a year of travel. Um, sort of fun, but maybe those days are going. You get to do expert advice. Um, court cases, amazing um, ones I've been involved with. You know, I've, in the US, a 54 car pileup in which a woman was burnt alive, and the grandparents of the fetus sued for the pain that the fetus was going to go through. Just extraordinary stuff. Well, there was the huge non invasive prenatal diagnosis patent I did um, in the US and here. Loved getting asked in court. Um, other experts said, just measuring a few snips in maternal blood is not genotyping. I said, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Number of snips, factorial, that's a chance of one in 64 quadrillion that two people would have the same genotype. That's more people than will ever live on this earth. Media, I had a bit of a time as a media tart. Why? Because I was good? Absolutely not, because we worked in the hospital next to BBC in London. So <laughs> you've always got to ask for an opinion and stuff. It's a big, the world is just changing so much. As a clinical scientist, you're at the heart of it. And you have a really varied career. You know, you can have several careers, but it's an antidote to boredom. So look, these are just hugely exciting times. Um, 21st century, the century of biological explosion in knowledge. 20 years last week since human genome was mapped. Interesting, no one got a Nobel Prize. You know, you map the whole genome of the fetus in the mother's blood now. Huge... Um, Contributions to cancer, especially childhood, CRISPR and base editing, making a huge difference. Diseases you can now cure. The long RNA therapies, big success in vaccines. We've now got the era of short RNA therapies for immune and inherited and, and particularly cancer. New drugs, you know, it used to be 10 or 20 a year. Now we're up to around 50. Look at last Thursday's New England Journal of Medicine drug, never even heard of. Um, very exciting times. So, you know, technology just gone berserk as well. I mean, you have a stroke or a heart attack now, you need to have your groin or your wrist shaved ready to go within 15 to 30 minutes. They can replace three valves now through your leg in your heart. So all these things you know about big data and all this is coming together with evidence and trying to work out societies, moving to prevention and health equity is a big issue, particularly in this country. It's interesting, when, um, when I worked here, um, laparoscopy, Surgeons would tell you that was for people who can't operate. Just how much things have changed. We had a thing in the Lancet in the early 1990s about sending a still ultrasound image via fat pipe, a secure UK US link to a hospital in the US for an opinion. I mean, all that sort of stuff has just changed too much. I remember being asked why I needed internet in the clinic in both countries. So, um, my kind of click here. What's going on? Um, Toolkit to get you started. You've got to have two of these three crucial ingredients. Smarts, hard work, and good luck. I think I, I had hard work and good luck rather than smarts, but um, you can get away with, if you've got three, you're really lucky. Can't really do it with one, you'll need two. You're going to do your training in series or parallel. That's academic and clinical. I did mine a little bit post hoc, you know, did the PhD after most of the clinical training. Some people do it well beforehand. Some people try and integrate it, which is the idea of clinical academic training. There are advantages to either. Mobility isn't a plus. In my day, you absolutely had to leave Australia, and that is no longer the case. But it does help to work in different institutions, and things are a different game abroad in some centres. Australia's pretty bloody good, though, these days. You need a mentor or two. You've got to plan and nurture your career. You can, you can laugh about that or things you wanted to do, but... It is true. You need to try and excel, I think, in both the clinical bit and the academic bit. You'll get a very bad reputation if you let your clinical skills lapse. Work-life balance, well, that's always an issue. I still manage to cycle about 12,000 K a year and race in Europe or the States every year. But um, that's a bit challenging. Why won't this work? No. Okay, so what are you going to do research in? Well, this is a bit of a challenge as you get started. Which way do you go? Um, the breadth versus depth issue, do you go for a major area or do you go for a micro area you can excel in with less competition? You really want impact, you're going to have to go for a major disease. 
Um, whatever you do, your plans will change. Some things will fizz out. You'll get failures. There's this Darwinian imperative. You can't get funding for it. It's likely to fall over. You should, if you can, align your clinical and research. There are some areas you don't need to. You do a couple of sessions of this thing and you concentrate on your research. But for many of us at, at sort of cutting edge clinical disciplines, you'll want to align both. Do you go wet or dry? Um, in my day, there was a push to do both. You know, the hero that took something from the laboratory to the animals to the clinic and did everything. I think those days are gone. I did try and do both. I mean, my own areas were started as trying to get DNA and cells out of mother's blood, and that led to stem cell discoveries and um, a whole lot of development of uh, intrauterine stem cell therapy, um, which has been tried in a couple of humans. Um, other area of fetal nociception didn't last more than about 10 years, um, although it was very political, um, and that then morphed into an understanding of this problem in genetically identical twins with different phenotype um, that was eventually partially addressed through intrauterine surgery. You need money to do this sort of stuff, and how you do that is, we'll talk about funding routes, but you also need some pocket money. And um, my experience is largely in the UK, and I used to do that through private practice, which was easy, and all that went to the institution. They pay about three times as much as Australia, so fewer patients are insured. Um, but that always gives you the opportunity to just roll on research fellows or pick someone bright and give them a job. Very important. It's all about team science now and interdisciplinary science. So um, it's interesting, the private practice issue, that's a big problem here in Australia. I always say you can be rich or famous. You have to choose the two. And um, you'll do okay as a clinical scientist, but maybe won't be right at the other end. Um, look, all my experience is from just so last century. So it's from the days of the dinosaurs, the, the single investigators stuck to their discipline, and you know we tried to cure everything. I think one of my big advantages is doing fetal medicine. It involved every body system. So I got to outreach to virtually every other branch of medicine and even some beyond, which I think was a help. Um, okay, two big deals now. It's all about team science, collaboration, um, nationally, locally, internationally. Interdisciplinary is where a lot of the action is at. Just think of all the opportunities you've got in biomedical engineering, in the, in the basic sciences, and through right through to law, economics, et cetera, even the arts. Um, internationally now, so Australia, um, all the, the GO5 universities, about 60% or more of their publications are in international journals. So you need to do some local stuff, but you should be aiming high. In your publication strategy, there's always this trick of author positions. If I see someone who's only first, well, they're obviously young. If I see someone who's only last, well, they're not really sharing or collaborating very much. You, you want a mix of permissions. You could be a little bit generous, but you'll get people say, I'm only doing 1% of your analyses. If I get 20 of my postdocs on your paper and you have to resist that, there are firm guidelines for authorship. Journal choice is huge, and, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but you want to give your submission the best shot. What people tend to do is to submit first sloppy draft to the top journal, rejected. Then they submit it to a middle rank journal with a bit more effort, rejected. And then they submit it to a low journal. But by the time it's got there, it's really good because it's been revised with all the reviewers' comments. So you want to get it right first time. These days, everything you write should be up on a preprint server, everything. You need to balance reviews. They're more cited, but don't do too many of them. Um, so they will get, they're often, for most of us, they're our most cited publications. Forget about book chapters or anything like that these days. Open access is good, although there are a lot of crap and predatory journals out there. And there's a big move now for the chief scientists to make open access ubiquitous for all Australian sourced publications. Okay, so we've shifted to quality over quantity. This country used to reward universities for the number of publications they've done. Unfortunately, we got rid of that. But um, which do you do? Well, the answer is you try and do both, but maybe not at the extremes. So publish one paper a year, it's probably a little bit of a trouble, you know, especially when you come to trying to get other grants, etc. On the other hand, you've got commercialization and translational priorities. If you've got IP and you can't do it, that, that's quite acceptable. We have researchers who bring in $5 million a year and do one publication a year. That's fine, but you've got to bring in the five million dollars a year. There's a fellow of uh, this college who um, has more than two hundred publications on their Google Scholar page since January last year. 
I don't think the rest of us are working hard enough if that's the case, but I think you can publish too much as well. So I always like this one from um, Wolfgang Pauli, a Nobel Prize winner in physics in 1946, who said, I don't mind you thinking slowly, but I do mind you publishing faster than you can think. So the emphasis has gone to quantity, quality. Sorry, aiming high, you should set yourself a stretch target. Do you go for a disciplinary journal or interdisciplinary if you can go broader or one of the major ones, but you only be able to do that a minority of the time? You learn from rejection. Sometimes it hurts a lot, but you know, sometimes there are asshole reviewers, you know, or people you don't like, et cetera, et cetera. Or they've got a grudge or they're doing something similar. But um, often you take umbrage and then come back a day later and actually maybe they're right on a few things and your paper gets improved. Make sure you've got to think like a reviewer when you send your papers off. That's why you've got to do reviews yourself and have your group doing reviews. Spotting the gap in the market, the journal that hasn't published anything on X yet, things like that. There is a bit of an element of luck, um, and it's increasingly competitive. This graph I've got down here shows, it's interesting, in, in medicine, publications only went up a touch during COVID eventually. Um, for non-medicine, the FWCI, how well it's cited compared to peers in its discipline, um, has stayed flat, whereas medical ones have gone down, partly because of the proliferation of journals of low quality, low impact. And that's, of course, compared to a world average, and the world average in most areas is going down. Okay, you need to grow your citations. So in my case, it was simple. You just need to turn up at a conference or work with a top group and, and you got cited. Now it's very, very different, particularly when people weren't traveling. So. You've got to aim your exposure to a mix of audience, not just academia, which is the way we used to do it. So social media, up to that. Internal newsrooms, get your university, medical research institute to get it up there. Science and Technology Australia will publicise it for you. Fresh Science is there for ECRs. The Conversation will take articles. Not that difficult to write. It's for a lay academic audience, but highbrow. You've got to look after your citations, find out who's citing you and why. And there are various metric services. Um, Altmetrics one, Plum is another. They'll tell you who's looking and why. Just some quick tips here. Um, make sure you connect all your social media so they all talk to each other, just all goes out on the one platform. Um, link all your papers with the DOI so people will go and click on the paper and then it gets picked up by the services. And just make sure you do this every day. This is hugely important now. So here are all the key online identifiers. Google Scholar is an absolute must. Orchid, you pretty well need to have. But there are a whole lot of others. If I was anyone your age, I'd be making sure I had a profile on every single one of them and be shouting everything else from the treetops. Make sure your institution knows about it because they will promote you. And if your name's John Smith or Yang Li, you're in a bit of trouble. You need to make sure that's filtered properly. Okay. So what about H-index? So H-index, um, for those of you who don't know, is the number of papers you have cited n times. So if it's 50, it's you've got 50 papers that have been cited and it gets tougher and tougher as it goes higher and higher. Um, it's very age dependent. So in early career, it won't be worth very much, but it's worth starting out to have a Google Scholar page. And um, the good thing is, for people our age, it goes up after we're dead. So, you know, because people, people can still keep citing you. So it is a little bit disciplinary dependent as well. So UNSW will have 35 people with H index above 100. About half, a bit more than half in medicine because it's a highly cited field. Um, Okay, funding strategies, the last thing I'm going to talk about. If I'm not too far over time. I don't think I am. Um, so, you know, how do you get started? That's probably the toughest bit. Um, beg, borrow, buy, or steal. You, you start with a local hospital, local not-for-profit funding, maybe a college scheme, maybe some state funding. Here we've got the OHMR, Office of Health and Medical Research. You, you really got to look widely for any opportunity you can, string things together, get something going. As you develop more towards, you know, get your early career going and towards the middle, um, there's an issue of do you apply for grants or do you apply for fellowships? Now, NHMRC, which is a mainstream funder, used to be one or the other. And then they had a whole lot of people with fellowships, but no pocket money to do the grants and a whole lot of people with grants, but no salary to do keep them going. So they've combined that in, in a new scheme now, which works reasonably well. Um, but these are usually for more senior levels. Um, Upskill yourself for your own applications by reviewing papers to start, but if you can get to review grants or even on a panel, uh, they don't exist as much anymore. These are really key things to hone your reviewing skills so you'll know what reviewers are looking for. 
It's a pretty depressive wicket, though, in terms of the Category 1 funding idea success rate. The ideas grants are ones where the track record's not supposed to count, only 11%. In the early career stages, the investigator grants last year, 18% and 12%. Sue's shaking her head there. Um, the MRFF had an own goal recently. Stupid mistake I'll come to on their behalf. But you know, when you get down to a success rate that's low, you get really depressed. So 50% of grant applications are absolute crap. So just bear that in mind. 50%, and, and they can be thrown out immediately. We should stop all this nonsense and reviewing them too much. 50% are, are fundable, but some are better than others. And, and that's where all the reviewing comes in. So when you get your score, as long as you're in the top 50%, it's worth another bite of the cherry and you learn a lot from that. But there are other schemes, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. But I just wanted to say you need to work really hard on these proposals. Um, someone estimated, this is almost 10 years ago, that Australians to the NH and MRC put in something like six centuries of effort for a single year's round. But you do want to spend a long time. Preparation, preparation, and preparation. No just in time. I hate to say the last two NH and MRC grants I had, I started two days beforehand. But um, I don't think you can do that anymore. You need to sketch out what you're going to do at least three months in advance. Make sure you present it to other people. Um, you want to be thinking up to a year in advance about pilot data and who you need on your team. It's not just you. It's not just the idea. It's You've got to make it bulletproof. Pick the dream team, but um, make it workable. Again, um, there are some people you don't want to collaborate with, but you want the strongest team usually, um, be it local or elsewhere. Put it up for internal review. If you can get someone review outside your discipline who doesn't quite understand it, because that'll be the people assessing it. Think summary, think impact, think what you've got as your unique selling points. And, and don't ignore all the compliance rules. University and MRI officers will help you with these. The compliance rules are quite extraordinary now. And if you get it wrong, you're out. And you may not be fussed if your grant gets thrown out, but all your collaborators will be mightily peeved. Um, and don't take shortcuts with with integrity and ethics, you'll be found out. And that is a complete no-no with grant applications. So I just want to talk about some of these opportunities. Um, Craig was mentioning MRFF. Look, this is a major funder now. Last year was uh, 724 million bucks. They dispersed NH and MRC and ARC are about 900 million. So that's really serious. It'll settle down at about 650. They do it over 21, last year was 22 different initiatives. It is all over the place. It has a bit of a checkered history the pork barreling and targeted grants, but that's now gone out following an audit review. Um, and they had, here's some of the schemes. I mean, the early mid-career researchers won, they only put 40 million bucks in, um, you know, that's a problem, dreadful success rate. Um, the proposals that go through the NH and MRC are okay. The ones that go through business.gov could be a bit of a nightmare. Um, it's run by the department and therefore bureaucrats and it's not academically led. There are a lot of criticisms around it, you know, huge overlap with the NH and MRC, um, complex multi-signatory schemes. Um, there are proposals both through the Accord and elsewhere at the moment to try and merge or at least have an oversight body, ARC, NH and MRC, and F. NH and MRC opportunities spend about 360 million a year on ideas grants, 241 million on, um, sorry, 361 on investigator, 241 on ideas. Clinical trials, 75. Partnerships, 28. Partnerships have a much higher success rate. Clinical trials as well. They're giving out a lot of money, particularly for team opportunities. And as you start, it, it, you really want to be going in with a more senior team who will help mentor and nurture you. Forget about synergy grants. They're for really senior players. Probably the same with centres of research excellence. And they don't have a clinical research fellow scheme anymore. It's just wound up in the general investigator scheme. The ARC has rules about not funding health and medical research, but it's largely around diagnosis and treatment. There are ways you can get significant grants out of the ARC, and you just need to bear all those schemes in mind. Here's a list of all the other opportunities that our medical investigators at UNSW have had funded over the last few years. You can read those, and I'm happy to share the slides with you if you like. Um, what else? Well, this is interesting. Just in thinking about this talk, I found I gave a similar talk 10 years ago. and this was the conclusion slide. I thought, oh, this must be way out of date. But actually, you go through it, top, back again, top institutions, mentors, personal testimonies, long run game, choose your opportunities widely, mobility, resources, pull versus push, cure the disease, not the patient, 
become an in, in opinion leader, innovator, end of team science, health, big data, AI collaboration. It hasn't changed that much. And I just finished with a few words on research leadership. This is a learned skill. And we don't really learn this in all our educational programs. And you've got a chance to build it up over decades. You know, you don't just go to university or do various degrees. Um, and that's worth taking seriously, going on courses, particularly with people outside the profession. Um, you've got to foster your own team, build them up, and be proud of your own offspring, your nurturers, your PhD fellows, your subspecialty training fellows, your registrars. Be proud of their careers. Don't get upset when they leave. They need to go out into the wide world on their own. Um, you've got to be an exemplar for high standards in all you do, a role model. Don't cut corners. You need to balance the local, national, and inter international contributions you make. Don't ignore the day job. And finally, um, you know, you've got to be modest, self-deprecate, generosity and partnership. Um, yeah, I was going to give you an example, but I can't think of one. All right. I just want to finish. Is Russell here yet? No. Russell Gruen is here this afternoon. Um, Russell and I are both um, on Research Australia, the national peak body for national medical research in the country. And I just finished with this unpaid advertisement, which is the last edition of the year of their magazine, Inspire, is all about clinical researchers. And I just recommend it to you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Professor Fisk. That was an amazing talk and many very um, useful practical tips, I think, for all those early and mid career researchers as well. We have a word in mind. Let's continue. We may have some questions from the online audience, so please feel free to type in your um, questions there as well. Do we have any? Do we have any questions from the floor before we begin? We have one online. Um, how doable is the hybrid clinician researcher role for women? Um, for us that have passion for both medicine and research. The long hours and travel is difficult to balance with life and family responsibilities. Do you have any advice in terms of the support for that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so look, it's a really tricky area. Um, you know, in fact, we were just talking about it outside. The um, yes, you should be able to develop a career, you know, with all sorts of caring responsibilities and time out and rope, you know, search performance expectations and have considerations for that. All that's true. Is it easy to do amidst the competition? No. Is it easier now than it was earlier? Yes. Um, we all strive to um, accommodate this in promotion processes and grant processes. Um, but if you talk about a 35 hour week, um, and you're not supposed to say this, um, I don't know, you talk about this profession, but you can talk about really any other major profession. You don't need people at the top who work 35 hours a week. So for me, it's about time management. That, that is the really crucial skill. So um, I jump on an airplane. I'm on the laptop pretty well all the way. I come here today in a cab so I can be on the laptop, and I'll go home in a cab. There's cabs everywhere. It, you just need to think of those sort of things. Um, managing family is, is a big deal. And you know, um, is it easier as a boy than a girl? Know the answer to that. I remember my son's 21st. Um, he got up and gave a speech and said, My father, wonderful father, every night without fail, he'd come home and wake me up to say good night. And, and that. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming and giving an awesome talk today. Um, my question was just, I was curious about how your MBA has informed your outlook in medicine and research as well. So I, I, interesting. I did the MBA at um, a time when I was trying to sort of move into research leadership. Um, I did it after I failed to get a major job. That was one reason. Um, and after I got it, I got a major job. So um, they tried to talk me out of doing it because um, I think I was almost 50. Um, I did it at Imperial College where the theme was, you know, the science of business, the business of science. Um, 
it was fantastic. So um, A, you get to mix with a whole lot of leaders you know, doing an executive MBA who are at the top of their architecture, lawyer, government, everything. That was great. The one thing I did that um, made a big difference was I think I got five publications out of it. So every time I had to do an assignment, I thought of something in my own area and ended up getting it published in BMJ and, and things like that. And part of that was because I worked with a great guy called Rifan Atun, who was at Imperial, went to Harvard, now come back. Um, and it, it was just a wonderful thing to do. Was it easy in terms of time management? Absolutely not. It cost me a fortune. But um, for me, I think it made a big difference. It does surprise you. You can go to a dinner party and talk about tin futures. But it, it does surprise me sometimes when I see colleagues of mine they use exactly the same language without having done it. And I just wonder, you know, um, I don't know the return on investment from it, but it was fun. And if you're trying to move in industry and entrepreneurship and commercialization, just having the letters after your name does help. Out. You've had a very interesting career trajectory that's kind of led you did you find it was challenging to navigate across and upwards from different areas or did you find like the same treatment and you've got a more diverse range of skill sets to jump around so look i think you need to be thinking where you're going and then sometimes you think um what don't i do quite as well so you know at one stage i thought i really don't understand laboratory science well you know i'd come at it more from Human pathophysiology, animal pathophysiology, but I needed to go and get trained in lab skills. So I went and did a sort of sabbatical in Germany. Um, but that wasn't easy to do. Um, you know, you're a full professor, you have to go and put on a, you have to go and work as a research assistant at the same time. Um, so you need to, I think, work out where the gaps are in, in what you're doing, um, and you need a bit of luck. Why was it considered a trade travel industry? So I said it again. I didn't, it's the mask. I didn't think. Um, why was it considered a trade travel industry? I grew up. I mean, we didn't have faxes, <laughs> mobile phones, anything like that. Um, there just wasn't the academic culture in Australia, really wasn't. Um, and particularly, and it's particularly for me in my discipline. So, you know, when I was here, all the clever physicians did PhDs, okay? And they went on, so, Barak, you, you did yours abroad or here? Here. But, you know, that was normal. So there was that environment in medicine, certainly not in surgery and the procedural discipline. Um, so in my discipline, I had to get out. Um, but I think even the top physicians all went abroad for a period of time. When I went to London, it was the absolute centre of the world in my academic discipline founded on rare diseases, and people came from all over the world to work there. The, the research group you were in, I don't think we had any English people. I used to joke when I was at Imperial that um, there's only one rule in my research group, there's no English people, because they wouldn't want to work there. You know, so it, that was a talent magnet. And, you know, it was, I mean, here, I remember sitting up, where's the library? Here somewhere. I don't, don't remember sort of, you know, the journals would be two or three weeks off, and you'd be going through paper copies. It's it just a different world. It was also fun. I also like travel. I think I spent, as an undergraduate, I spent 11 months abroad at the end of your course. Um, I think we have one last question here. Thank you so much for that very honest talk. Uh, you mentioned a lot of the upsides, but also the important downsides about, um, I guess, research and working in academia. Um, how, how would you kind of describe the um, advantages and also disadvantages of working in research? Working in industry. Yeah. Okay. So like the more commercial, I guess, aspect of research. So this is a huge issue at the moment. Um, it's a huge issue outside medicine where, you know, um, government is driving, industry is pulling, sovereign capability, manufacturing, all those things, us to developing a smart Australia, not just digging stuff out of the ground. We spend as a nation 1.78% of R&D, of GDP on R&D, Used to be much higher than some of our other countries. Have got 
the most raucous thing. So we have a real problem here in Australia. We're trying to address that. The problem is not so much hospitals, universities, medical research institutes. It's a pull from industry. It just doesn't exist like yet here. There's a lot of effort going on into building up medical biotech. That, that is a huge one. And some big successes, Melbourne, Queensland, et cetera. There's a huge developments now here in RNA and gene therapy, et cetera. Um, drug companies like doing trials here. Um, it is seen as a gateway into Southeast Asia. So I, I think all that is changing. Um, if you're trying to do a career, you know, it, it's tricky. So we've got, there are six trailblazer drugs in the country. We've got the universities, we've got the industry, um, the government. They're worth about a quarter of a billion each. We managed to get two of the six of them. That's what I spend a lot of my time on. Now, part of that's around changing the culture to promote entrepreneurship and commercialization and working with industry. But it, it's the pull from industry we've really got to work on. There is a big deal around academic careers and how you judge it when the whole system is based on publications and granting. In my experience, those at the top who are already professors do quite well publishing in top journals, bringing in lots of money. As you're trying to develop your career, it's a bit <coughs> unless you're on a winner, I'd be a little bit cautious about jumping into industry very early on. Unless, of course, you're quite happy to go and stay in it. Many people are, and you don't know if it's too soon. So you know, I think you'll find a lot more activity in this space. We're going to have to think about how we assess people and nurture careers when that's quite a, a valid pathway. But some people think of it a bit too simplistically. The government has this doctrine of careers in engineering, careers in medicine, careers in industry. I think it's something else. Thank you. I think we have one last question yes. online. Um, Nick, this question comes in um, from someone saying, as a med student starting out in a rural, a rural area, is it correct to say that pursuing this career requires you to be in a metropolitan site or are there opportunities improving in the re regional area? Yeah, so sorry, my talk is very much based at this sort of elite end of the spectrum. Um, there are a lot of initiatives now around um, rural and remote research. There are big clinical trials initiative in, in rural and rem remote. If that's your aim, you know, it's very important and valid work because there are big um, health equity issues, there are big delivery issues in, in the country. Um, so, you know, the thing would be to align yourself with a goodish, you know, local regional center and a university or medical research institute to help pursue that. So, you know, that, that I am conscious that's one area I didn't really cover as well as as much in, in allied health or people who want to pursue, you know, predominantly research career and just keep their hand in clinical. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Fisk.